Well, good morning. Before we uh, begin our time in the Word, I just wanted to sing a song together. So, uh, if you don't know the song, it's easy enough to learn. It's just uh, speaking about the glory of God and how His glory is great and what He did for us in Jesus. So, I just want to sing it together. If you don't know it, it's easy to learn. God came down and gave his life for me, amen, amen. Through flesh and blood he fought for victory, amen, and amen. Crucified and brought back. Back to life, Amen and Amen. Seated at the Father's hand again, Amen and Amen. Great is your glory. Great is the glory of the Lord Almighty. And great is the glory of the Lord, and I will sing with all my heart unto the Lord Almighty. Great is your glory, Lord. Crimson covered, and crimson covered over sinless hands. Amen and Amen But nails could never hold the Son of Man Amen and Amen And now the Father's love flows down on us Amen. And hallelujah, he will come again. Amen. And amen. Great is your glory. Great is the glory of the Lord Almighty. And great is the glory of the Lord. And I will sing with all my heart unto the Lord Almighty. Great is your glory, Lord. You are the one who was, and you are the one who is, and you are the one who is to come. And great is the glory of the Lord. And I will sing with all my heart unto the Lord Almighty. Great is your glory, Lord. Father, this morning, as we have the privilege, Lord, of opening up your word together. Lord, I ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, God, that you would come. Out of the enormity, God, of your love for us, the truth of who you are, God, your goodness, your grace, Lord, come. Give us, God, ears that hear you, God, eyes that see you, 
Lord, hearts that are open to you. Yeah, Lord, and just do what you do best. Just, just point us to yourself, Lord, that we might know you, the one true God. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Excellent. Thanks for singing along. You can go ahead and open up to the book of John. We'll be in chapter 7. All right, today in John chapter 7, we're going to close out the chapter. So we've been on a several week journey getting through John chapter 7. There's lots and lots of really great info in here. But specifically today, we're going to look at how the crowd of people that Jesus has been debating with are divided over Jesus' identity. And they all have different opinions about who they think Jesus is. But having the correct opinion about Jesus is essential. Now... But before we begin our time together, I want to uh, remind us that Jesus is in the middle here in John chapter 7 of an active debate. And his debate and discussion that's going on is between Jesus and then the common people of Israel that are there on the Temple Mount, the Jewish crowd, and the leaders of the Jews called the Pharisees. And it's happening on the Temple Mount. And this discussion is happening uh, in the midst of the last day uh, of tabernacles, a feast that the Jews would celebrate. Now, previously, last week, for the setup for today, Jesus has just finished walking up to the Pharisees, uh, hypothetically, and just poking them smack dab in their eyes and exposing uh, their plans to want to kill Christ. And afterward... Jesus makes this claim, and they uh, proceed to deny Jesus' claim. They say, oh, Jesus, you're demon-possessed. But before long, uh, in the midst of the conversation, even if you go back to verse 32, they attempt to have Christ arrested. And all of this happened on the last day of this Jewish feast. It's the final of these seven feasts of the Lord uh, that the Jews would celebrate according to God's word. And it was on the last day of this feast, the great day, And during that day, we discussed last week how on that day, the temple crowd uh, was quietly listening for the sound of water being poured out over the altar by the priests that they had gathered from the pool of Siloam. And the people are uh, anticipating making this prayerful, uh, worshipful shout, asking God to send them great salvation. And it's in this moment Back in verses 37 and 38, it says that Jesus stood up and he cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, with that context in mind, that great claim of Jesus, let's find out what transpires next here at the end of chapter 7. In verses 40 through 43, we read, when they heard these words, what words? These words Jesus just spoke, if anybody thirsts, okay? Some of the people said, this really is the prophet, capital P. Others said, this is the Christ or Messiah. But some said, is the Christ to come from, from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there's division among the people over Christ. Now, first of all, in this final section, here in John 7, uh, John's going to highlight how different groups of people respond to the words of Christ. At this point, Jesus has concluded his portion of the debate. You're not going to find Jesus saying anything else in the end of John chapter 7. His portion is over, but now the people are left uh, to try to sort through what Jesus might have meant with some of these amazing claims. And the first group says, of the common people there in the crowd, some thought that Jesus was the prophet. 
And this prophet that he's speaking of here is prophesied by Moses all the way back in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 18, verses 15 through 18, where the Lord prophesies through Moses and says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him that you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb or Mount Sinai on that day of the assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They're right in what they've spoken. Again, verse 18, prophesied again, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I'll put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. So the crowd hears some of these statements Jesus makes, and some in the crowd say, ah, this is this prophet that we've been waiting for, that Moses prophesied about, okay? Jesus was and is this prophet. They are correct. However, Jesus is more. The next batch of people in the crowd argue, and they say, no, he's the Christ. He's the Messiah. They too, right, are correct. Jesus was and is the Messiah. And still others, though, wrestled with reconciling prophecies that were written about the Messiah with what they knew about Jesus. And they knew that Jesus currently lived and taught primarily up north in the Galilee region. And they were aware that the Messiah would be born down south, south of Jerusalem in Bethlehem, not in Galilee. And as a result, the crowd of common people who were there on the Temple Mount, they're divided over the identity of of Jesus. And some in the crowd are so familiar, listen, this is important, they're really familiar intellectually up here with Scripture, with what the Bible says. And they knew the prophecies, the predictions about future coming events, right, about who the Messiah would be. Yet, the Messiah, whose prophecies that they could quote, is standing in their midst, and they don't recognize him. They can quote the prophecies, but they can't even recognize the Messiah who's standing in their midst. Uh, John writes about this dynamic early on in his gospel. In chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, he wrote and said, The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, And the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Speaking of Jesus, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. They they knew information up here, but they they missed the ship entirely as the Messiah is standing in their presence. And uh, I found this quote this week when I was uh, hanging out doing some studying Uh, from A.W. Pink in his uh, commentary. It was really interesting. He said, unless your hearts are affected and our lives molded by God's word, meaning there's change, application, not just knowledge, then we are no better off than a starving man with a cookbook in his hand. (laughs) You know, if, if if you know this book and you know this book cover to cover and front to back and all it is is up here, You're no better off than a man who's starving to death holding a cookbook in his hand. And that's kind of what's going on here with the Jews, right? They they know these prophecies and their Messiah is standing in their midst. And they're divided. The crowd is over, who is this Jesus? Well, not much has changed, right? Still today, people are trying to decide the identity of Jesus. I was thinking about it. It's amazing when you stop and think. Uh, that one man who lived in a tiny, obscure uh, country that was oppressed, Israel, he was of common birth. He's lived uh, approximately 2,000 years ago, and he's still the main subject of so many debates. How is it that this one guy who lived in a little tiny country you know, 2,000 years ago Why are we still talking about this guy 2,000 years later? To me, it's one of the greatest facts that upholds Jesus' claim to be Christ, Jesus' claim to be the Lord. Why else would he still cause such a debate thousands of years later? 
But as we previously discussed when we started our journey in chapter 7, Jesus can only be one of three things. He claimed to be God, therefore he can only be one of three things. We'll revisit it briefly here today. He can either, so he claims to be God, either his claims are false or his claims are true. That's our only two options, right? There is no other option. If his claim was false, he either knew it was false or he didn't know it. If he knew it, he was a hypocrite because he told all people how to live their lives and not lie and he's lying to them. Not only that, he was a demon because he told people, hey, you put your faith in me and I'll get you to heaven. So ultimately, he's a liar. Right? If he didn't know it, he's just deluded. He's psycho, right? He's lock him up and put him in a padded cell, right? So he's a lunatic. However, if you go and you think about the things that Jesus said and how Jesus lived his life, we discussed it previously, but there is no way that Jesus was a liar. It's a a slam dunk. I can prove it that that wasn't the case. Certainly, he wasn't a lunatic. We can prove that also. So therefore, his claims are true. He claims to be God. His claims are true. Then if that's the case, then Jesus is Lord. And if he's Lord, we're only left with two choices. Either we accept that he's Lord or we reject it. But we don't have any other options regarding the identity of Jesus. Now, regarding you and regarding me, do you think anybody's going to be talking about you 2,000 years from now? (laughs) I don't don't even care. Listen, there's there's lots about Trump that I love. His narcissism I despise. Um, I guarantee you Uh, that nobody's going to be talking about Donald Trump 2,000 years from now, as much as he really wants them to. Okay? They won't. But who are we talking about 2,000 years later? Some carpenter lived half a world away, born in a dump of a town, or lived in a dump of a town, Nazareth, born in Bethlehem. Why are we still talking about Jesus all these years later? It's because he's Lord. Verses 44 through 46. Some of them, speaking of people in the crowd, we'll find out who here in a second. Some of them wanted to arrest Jesus, but no one laid a hand on him. And the officers then came to the chief priests and the Pharisees who said to them, why did you not bring Jesus? Why didn't you bring him? And the officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. No one ever spoke like this man. Now, remember back in verse 32 here in chapter 7, the Pharisees sent out the temple officers to go and arrest Jesus. And we find out here in chapter, in verse 44, that they wanted to get it done. They had the desire to do so, but not the ability to get it done. And it reminds me of how Jesus responded when he's uh, put on trial and he's being interrogated by the Roman officer Pilate and Pilate um, flexes his muscles basically in front of Christ and says in John chapter 19 verses 10 through 11, it says, Pilate said to Jesus, you will not speak to me. Do you not know that I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered Pilate and said, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. These officers roll up and they want to arrest Jesus, but they can't get it done. Why? Because God's in control. He will accomplish His plan, His purpose. Jesus Christ was in control of the situation because Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, the officers, they've got the will to arrest Jesus, but not the power to pull it off. I was thinking about it. So, they arrive back with empty handcuffs, right? To the Pharisees. And the Pharisees question them, and they say, hey, why didn't you fulfill your duty? Well, they were unable to fulfill their duty because they weren't God. All the foolish, evil plots of men 
against God are in vain. All of them. Listen to what uh, David writes in the book of Psalms as he makes a prophetic uh, a psalm about the coming of Christ. He said, Psalm 2, 1 through 4, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointed or against his Messiah, his Christ. And they say, verse 3, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. They look at God's laws and God's orders and God's commands. They go, ah, oh, what a bunch of nonsense. Sound familiar? Right? Let's just burst. Who needs that? Listen to God's response. Verse 4, it says, He who sits in heaven laughs. And the Lord holds them in derision. Puny little man down here saying like, oh, I'm God, I'm God. And God just sits in heaven and goes, you, you're crazy. He holds them in derision. Later on in the book of Psalms, chapter 37, verses 12 through 13, it says, the wicked plots against the righteous and he gnashes his teeth at them, but the Lord laughs at the wicked for he sees that his day is coming. Who's, who's in control ultimately? You, me, this world's system, or God? The Bible says God is. Jesus is Lord. And I love hear the officer's response to the Pharisees. They just say, man, nobody ever spoke like this man. Nobody ever spoke like Jesus, and they're right. It's part of the reason why we're still talking about Jesus 2,000 years later. Nobody ever spoke like this man. I thought it was interesting. Instead of arresting Jesus, they are arrested by the words of Jesus. Nobody ever spoke words. Nobody ever spoke like this man. They were right. Nobody has ever spoke like Jesus. Why has nobody ever spoken like Jesus in the history of humanity? Because Jesus is the God-man. He's the God-man. Only Jesus. John puts it this way in John chapter 1, verse 1, at the beginning of this gospel we're in right now. In the beginning was the Word, speaking of Jesus, capital W. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word, or Jesus, was with God, and the Word, or Jesus, was God. Then, fast forward just a few verses to verse 14, and the Word became what? And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, tabernacled among us. And we have seen His glory. The glory is of the only Son from the Father. And what is Jesus full of, if you know the verse? He's full of grace. He's full of grace. Boy, that's good news. Raise your hand if you need grace. Jesus has got plenty. He's full of grace and truth. In a world that we're living in, you know, we're just like we have abandoned the idea of truth. Who's still truthful? Whose truth still remains supreme? Who still gives us the guidelines for how we're supposed to live when we're trying to how, how to figure out how to live life? Where should we go for those answers? Oh, we should go to the truth. He's full of grace. He's full of truth. Jesus said of his own words in John chapter 6, verse 63, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. The officers come back to the Pharisees and they say, hey, nobody ever spoke like this man. I hope and pray that we're all amazed at the word of God. I hope we're all arrested by the words of Jesus. We can't get them out of our head. Here's a good one to be arrested by. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. 
Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Verse 47 through 49, the Pharisees answered the officers and said, Have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. And what they really say is, like, but this crowd, this stupid crowd, these foolish people that don't know anything, they're accursed. Now, the Pharisees, again, they're the leaders of the Jews. They're the ones who should know the right answers, and they don't. Instead, they hate Christ. And they continue to respond from their same old playbook. Every single time these guys get questioned, when you read the Gospels, it happens over and over again. Uh, when they don't have a good answer, which is often, uh, they just employ verbal abuse. They mock their opponent. They just basically call the temple officers simple-minded fools who've been deceived by Jesus' teachings. Then, then they hold themselves up as paragons of wisdom, paragons of uh, righteousness, Woo, I'm so good. Look at us. We're so amazing. And then they belittle the common folk, you know, a bunch of uneducated backwater idiots. Why would you listen to them? Yet, it's not the crowd of commoners nor the temple police that are fools here. Right? Instead, it's what uh, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26-28. through 28. Paul writes and says, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world. Shame the wise. God chose what is weak in this world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. They profess themselves to be wise, and they're what? Fools. But the crowd, the crowd's beginning, in some respects, to get it. Now, before we proceed here to the conclusion of this chapter, I want to pause for just a second and remember that this final section of Scripture exposes here in John 7 a wide variety of opinions about the true identity of Jesus. The crowd is split into basically three camps. Some are convinced Jesus is the long-awaited prophet. Some are convinced that he is the Messiah. Well, Jesus was and is the prophet. He was and is the Messiah. The officers are arrested by his words. And we're still blown away by his words today. And then we arrive... At the Pharisees. And the Pharisees, if you know anything about Scripture, they are the dreaded opponents and persecutors of Jesus Christ the Lord. Who's the one that gets Jesus crucified? Pharisees. The Pharisees. These men are so lost in their own self-righteousness that they seem beyond salvation. Or were they? Verse 50. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus before, who was one of them, said to them, so he's a Pharisee, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? And they replied, here they go back to their playbook, are you from Galilee too? Search the scriptures and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. Who is Nicodemus? He's a Pharisee. He's a member of this council that eventually wants to kill Christ. But unlike his companions, it's really good. Unlike his companions, Nicodemus was thirsty. And he took Jesus at his word and he simply came to Christ and he drank the word of Christ. Nicodemus is an interesting uh, gospel character. You only find him in the Gospel of John. 
And in John, Nicodemus appears three times. The first time he appears is in chapter 3, right? We meet him first while Jesus is in Jerusalem and he's just cleansed the temple. And Nicodemus, we know from Scripture, chapter 3 of John, he comes to Jesus at night and Nicodemus participated in the most significant conversation possibly in human history. It's there that Nicodemus and his ears heard for the first time, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And when Nicodemus heard those words, he was arrested by those words of Jesus also. And he got to hear those words from the lips of God himself. Now, this is the second time that we encounter Nicodemus. Chapter 7. And at this point, it's been, we know from the biblical timeline, it's been about a year and a half since their clandestine conversation. And we're not yet sure if he has surrendered his life to Jesus or not. But you can know one thing for certain. He's not in the same place as his companions anymore. Nicodemus, I think this is really cool. He raised his voice against his legalistic friends, right? They're all about the law. He raises his voice against his legalistic friends and he points them to the law that they claimed to keep. Okay? Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 16. I think I asked Caleb for that. Then I charged your judges at the time, saying, Hear the cases between your fellow countrymen, and judge righteously between a man and his fellow countrymen, or the alien who is with him. All right, Jesus is saying, hey, what are we doing? We haven't even heard this guy. You got, you're going to bring a charge against him? We need to hear him first. Even the law tells us we've got to hear him first. I think I asked Lizzie for uh, Proverbs 18, 13. To answer before listening or before hearing is folly and shame. Now, to Nicodemus's credit, not only does he have the courage to speak up at the risk of losing his own social status, but he even backs up what he said with his own behavior. Because what did Nicodemus do himself? He practiced what he's preaching. What did he do with Jesus? He had questions about Jesus, so what did he do? He approached Jesus at night. He entered into a discussion with Jesus. He heard Jesus' case, and he listened before he passed judgment. He's simply asking his companions to do the same thing. But here's the cool thing about Nicodemus. If you're familiar with the parables of the sower and the seed, the stories that Jesus shared about a farmer and he goes out to sow seed, right? And as he casts the seed, it falls falls on four different types of soil. There's a roadway, right? There's rocky soil, there's weedy soil, and there's good soil, right? And then Jesus goes on to explain this parable, and he speaks about how this seed that's being cast out there is the Word of God. Jesus is the Word of God. And as that seed is cast out, that seed is so powerful that if that seed is allowed to remain, it'll bear fruit. That's what's happened here with Nicodemus. That night, back in John chapter 3, The words of Jesus have rested in the soil of his soul and they have begun to grow. We see the seed of God's word literally germinate as Nicodemus takes his first stand for Christ. It's really cool. And without a moment to reflect, without pausing and thinking at all, the Pharisees run to their knee-jerk reaction again and they verbally abuse their friend and their colleague and they call him a Galilean, which is basically, basically like calling someone an uneducated redneck trailer trash today. Right? You uneducated 
backwater idiot. Then they finished off their bullying response. <laughs> Doesn't say they put their nose in the air. I can see them like when I, verb when I visually see it. You know, you can see them nose in the air, full of pride. So far in the air were their noses that they actually exposed their own foolishness. And they encouraged Nicodemus and they said, go search the scriptures. Go search this. We know this. Up here. Go search the scriptures. See that no prophet arises from Galilee. Well, guess what? Well, prophets do arise from Galilee. And it's right there in scriptures that they claim to know. Uh, one of the books of the Bible, the book of Jonah. Guess where Jonah was born? In Galilee, in the Galilee region. Not to mention, where does Jesus come from? Where, where has he been living? Where has he been doing all of his public ministry? In the Galilee. And he did it up there for a reason. We read it last week. I want to read it again. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 2. This is a prophecy about Jesus long before he's ever born. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun, the, ne the land of Nephtali. Those are uh, areas in the, in the northern part of Israel by the Sea of Galilee. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who walked in darkness. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And those who dwell in the land of deep darkness, on them the light has shown. So there is supposed to be a Messiah who is to come. From the Galilee. Now, the last verse here in 53, it says, They each went to their own house. Now, after belittling Nicodemus, the Pharisees, they take off and they go to their own houses for the night. Now, we can just draw a couple of interesting tidbits from this final verse before we discuss next week uh, Jesus' controversial encounter with the adulterous woman. So you want to make sure you're here. This, that's like it's such a crazy, amazing story in Scripture. But first, they probably went to their house because it was the end of the day. It was sunset. It was the final day of tabernacles. The feast was finished. And so they were headed to their house instead of their booth that they'd been living in for the week, like they would live in during tabernacles, okay? Also, remember that they leave this conversation having concluded that they need to get rid of Jesus. That's the emphasis as we close out chapter 7. Chapter 7 and chapter 8, it's like one story, right? We want to keep it in perspective. But they close chapter 7 thinking, what can we do to get rid of Jesus? They tried to arrest him, it failed. We're left to imagine that maybe they continued to concoct other schemes into the night. Uh, next week when we roll up, you'll see what scheme they concoct. Second, I want to close here though with Nicodemus. When he first comes to Jesus, what time of day is it? Nighttime. It's nighttime. When Nicodemus takes his first stand for Jesus, it's interesting, it's at twilight. It says the sun is setting. The next time we encounter Nicodemus, he will be a full-fledged follower of Jesus Christ and he steps out into the bright daylight to align himself with Jesus Christ, his Lord. As we conclude this chapter, I just want to pause and I want to ask you the same question that Jesus asked the Apostle Peter one day. Who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say He is? Remember where we began. He can only be one of three. He's either a liar, or He's a lunatic, or He's Lord. And He isn't a liar, and He's not a lunatic. He's Lord. And it's my hope and my prayer that all of us uh, would be brought by the power of His Holy Spirit to a place where we too can proclaim from a place of faith, Jesus, 
You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen? Amen. Father, I'm so thankful for the gift of your word. I'm so thankful, Lord, that you had men and you inspired men through the power of your Holy Spirit to write down what you said. So that 2,000 years later, half a world away, we can open up what you said, we can read it for ourselves, and we too, like the officers that day, can be arrested by the words of Jesus. No one ever spoke like you. Jesus, you claimed to be God, and you are. You alone are worthy to be praised and honored. God, we celebrate this morning that we come to a God today who is not full of hate and vengeance, but you're our Messiah who is full of grace and truth. We need you, Jesus. I need you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Before I dismiss this morning, um, I just feel prompted to say that um, I don't... I don't believe in Jesus um, for, I don't know, for foolish reasons. I don't know the best way to say it, but... I'm just a broken man. And I need a Savior. And so are you. And when we're out here as, as followers of Jesus Christ, the last thing in the world that should ever happen with us is to run around with our noses in the air, like the Pharisees. For me to admit that I am a Christian is for me to admit that I am a failure. I make no grand claims about myself. I am a sinful, broken man. But Jesus isn't. And I follow Jesus because I need to be saved. And because of Jesus Christ, I am saved. And someday, because what Jesus said is true, I will see the Lord face to face. And he will say to me, not based upon my goodness, not based upon any good things I've done because I don't have a big list of good stuff. He'll just look at me and he'll say, Patrick, welcome home. You're my son. Why? Because of Jesus and what he did for me. Jesus and what he did for you. May the Lord just help us live simple lives and just trust Jesus for who he said he is. He's Lord. You're dismissed.